we, I will introduce myself. Please introduce yourself one by one. Okay. My name is Damien Kai. Um, I'm chairperson of this event. So I'm also taking care about the Myanmar Internet HA. So that, thank you so much for attending this event and joining this panel discussion. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ed. I represent a company named uh, Netsys from Singapore. Uh, and we are happy to be here with you uh, this afternoon and share more, uh, some information about content filtering and how Myanmar can basically adopt these uh, technologies, regulations, and so on uh, to, to provide more security to our people. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Ajit Pascal, uh, representing uh, Paracom Technologies, and also actually I'm a senior academic uh, uh, at the University of Morocco, Sri Lanka. Hello, everyone. My name is Warren Finch. I work for APNIC at the moment. I'm actually representing myself, I would assume, in this point of view. So I haven't got official approval, so all these opinions are my opinions. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Mike. Um, I have the uh, you know, fortune to work with Matei Mikai um, 15 years, probably no, 18 years ago uh, as a, a junior network engineer. So the first, you know, the first of the first ISPs is Bagan Cybertech. So I was an uh, engineer there and responsible for connectivity, going to the internet, as well as proxy, uh, Squid, Dance Guardian, I'm sure you guys hate access denied at all. Sorry, I didn't do it on purpose. Um, and I've uh, been there and then since then I've, I've been around um, in Singapore, come, come back, work for uh, a telco as well as a, a bank and a consulting firm currently. So yeah, happy to be here. Mingala Babia, this is Nai from YNTB. I'm just a Sawa admin and kind of big data and Security Administrator. Thank you. So I'd like to, uh, uh, I'd like to briefly explain about this, uh, wh why this kind of panel discussion happened. So, um, PDD issued a letter on November 18, 2019 to, uh, to all network operators, ISPs, to taking care, care about the, uh, to protect child abuse over the content, so taking care to filter China abuse websites. In the, in the document, the, uh, they are mentioned between 2017 and 2019, uh, total rape case, 64.98% uh, uh, of the total rape case are uh, uh, victims are children. So, uh, they, the now our, our network operators should start thinking about uh, filtering system. Uh, we have a long story. Our internet, Myanmar internet, started with a uh, very heavy filtering system. So long back to nearly 20 years ago. Mike Pomi is working with me. So. Uh, that guy, uh, 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 first filtering system began somebody use, used was um, Dance Guardian. Yeah. Dance Guardian, there is a message that has been denied with a red color. <laughs> so I remember that uh, most of the, our user, internet user, very familiar with that page. And now, and after uh, Dance Guardian is uh, not commercial use, but we are. Uh, uh, not, not for commercial organization. We use it, but after we get a warning from them, we are trying to change another system, blue code. So blue code message is different, not red color, not oh, seen as- Ma Makai, I think it's not blue code. I think it was uh, 40 gate after that. Oh, uh, 40 gate. Yes, oh, yeah. so, Nest Cream 40 gate. Uh, yeah. cream. So message is different. So customer already used to, with uh, has been denied with red color. So uh, w w when they do, uh, could not see that text and color, they complain so much. So I asked my poem 
to change the script, sing like a dance guardian. <laughs> so we are doing like that. So okay, let's start this discussion. So PDD is asking the uh, advice from the community how to take care of this kind of uh, this kind of filtering. So I'm inviting not only local experts but also in international who have experience about the uh, filtering system. So let me start. So many questions. Eh? From, we, uh, let's start with the government and policy. For the filtering system, uh, who should, uh, which kind of policy should government should enforce or op operators need to decide? So uh, you better start. So can you provide me your insight in, in, in initiatives and measures? which were taken by the government to fight malicious and restricted content. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I cannot speak on, on behalf of any government. So it's based on pure experience uh, and what we had seen and what we had done in other countries. Um, it's a sensitive topic. Uh, it's something always... Um, um, in battle between the human rights advocator and basically the enforcement agencies. It always question the morals, the ethics. It also always asks about the freedom of expressions, the freedom of your access, basically the human rights um, uh, to, to have access to the contents. But I think uh, one of the great example that we had learned in the past is, for example, it's from Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, since 1996, the, the Infocom, Media Development Authority, already drafted actually provisions of uh, policies and informations on how this unwanted content such as pornography, such as uh, gambling, weapons, drugs, and so on, needs be controlled. So from then on, they also work with other agencies such as uh, uh, Ministry of Home Affairs to basically enforce all these policies as part of government compliance to secure license. So I, I think that's one of the first steps. The government agencies need to make sure that there is a law, uh, a law that is actually open, uh, uh, balanced and you can say that it's fair to everybody. Because for us, what we think is that URL filtering, content filtering, is not mainly for adult people like us. We don't need content filtering because we are all matured. But it's about the ethics on how we protect the next generation, the young ones. What will happen to the country if you're like Makain says that the, the rape case in Myanmar is really high for the kids. These are the results of having uh, uh, and access to, to, to contents without any measures. So the second thing that was done by, by Singapore is to educate the people, continuous education. So the first is the policy, the second is the continuous education. It, they went to the schools to basically educate all the kids, even uh, at a very young age, for them to understand what is mature and which one are immature contents. So education. The third one is the self-restricting uh, um, initiative, which means that the agency itself, the, 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 not only agencies, but also individuals or enterprise companies must have, must have their self-reservation, basically, whether these contents that they're producing or distributing are ethical or not. So I think these are the three major things that you, we can learn uh, from, from Singapore. You have experience about the, your, uh, the, your country? So I can add a few things uh, from my own experience. I mean, I uh, almost agree 100% with what Edward was saying. Um, it's, it's not something something that we should really practice as such. I mean, for adult, adult mature people, there's no need for absolutely for content filtering, but uh, there is always this dark side of the internet. And uh, as for Sri Lanka also, I think uh, 
one other, I mean, we are not fully, uh, internet penetration actually is not 100%. So the, the daily number of users, new users, particularly the, uh, the kids who are actually going to the internet actually daily increasing. And uh, at the moment, we don't have a, a nationwide a policy as such. So I had the experience like long time back in uh, 2007, uh, I was in charge uh, of Im uh, like implementing a school net which actually was under, under my university. We established uh, the uh, school net, a wide area network connecting all the schools in Sri Lanka. And one of the mandatory requirement uh, uh, in that setup was to have a, a filtering system because it was like uh, the, during the school time, uh, the, all the kids were exposed to internet through the system. So they are, they are, they, we were mandated by the government at that time uh, to have a filtering system to ensure that the students will not be exposed to any unnecessary material as such. So whenever we are talking about content filtering, I think we need to look at, I mean, which age group, which segment that we are talking about. It's not a, uh, like a blanket filtering system as such. And the, the experience that we got was actually the moment that we implement the system, I think the parents were very, very satisfied. I mean, they had the concern, like if the students at, the, at, at school, during school, get exposed to this one, what will happen? Like, because, I mean, you know, the kids are very curious. I mean, they are very innovative. And they try to experiment. And they, they, when, they, when they get exposed to a content where they are not able to understand exactly, the good and bad of that particular act that, that they are seen uh, in the internet. So they tend to experiment. So the government, the teachers, the religious leaders, all of them are very concerned when the announcement actually went out saying that, okay, we are going to provide internet to all the students, all schools. So, but they got like, uh, they, later they got actually uh, uh, happy. They were ha happy about the decision at the same time that we will be actually putting a filter in place so that any unwanted content uh, will be blocked. That was an assurance uh, from the Ministry of Education to all the, uh, the parents and the religious leaders. So that was uh, uh, one good step in that one. But uh, having said that, at that time, the broadband penetration actually was not that heavy in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, so, but now, after 15 years or so, like broadband has virtually penetrated to the every part of the country. So even though the students actually have do not have access to this unnecessary or unwanted part of the internet during school time, whenever they get home, uh, they get <laughs> exposed to these things because the broadband or the mobile operators did not have a, a system in place as such. Now, after 10 years, now the government is again like uh, uh, coming out with the proposal that every operator must have uh, uh, some kind of a measure, some kind of a system uh, to, uh, to, to block this content. But there, like the, what I feel actually, there is two very important uh, um, things that you need to look at. When you come up with policies, when you come up with policies, it's very important that you need to get all the stakeholders involved in drafting these policies. I mean, it's not a, not a blanket uh, somebody, one person decide, let's block all these uh, uh, things as such. So you need to actually get people from all, uh, maybe from religion, relig religious leaders, education authorities, psychologists, and all sort of people to get form a committee and prepare a global set of policies that everybody are satisfied with, okay, blocking all of them is fine. And so those global policies should not be large. I mean, you, don't, you should not have thousands of policies like that, thousand rules uh, or global rules as such. It should be minimum, bare minimum. And the remaining part should be given to the, uh, to the end user or the enterprise or the school or any organization or to the parents to decide the local rules that they want to impose on their students or, the, or their kids. So it's like a two-level two hierarchical thing, a global policy at the top level so that the government decides with the participation of all the stakeholders, all the agreeable. So this part actually is, can be blocked without any, any uh, uh, downside as such, without actually, let's say, for example, since we are, our, our major focus is trying to uh, protect the, the kids or the next generation, I mean, without corrupting their mind. So, so everybody agrees that, okay, this should be blocked as such. But individually, it is up to the parents, depending on their religious belief, depending on their background, and to what level other things should be, because the main thing that we should keep in mind is we should never 
use this method to block the curiosity or innovativeness of the students. I mean, they learn a lot by having access to the internet. I mean, we should not actually have a blanket, a blanket set of policies that will kill that. Uh, so what happened is they will use illegal means to acquire that knowledge somehow, and that will be more dangerous than uh, uh, like getting, uh, getting uh, from direct sources. Okay, that is, that is uh, my current experience as such. Like the, there should be a policy level. There is a, like, I mean, you need to have a stakeholder participation in come on, coming up with particularly the global policies. Because other, others are done at the local level. Enterprise or the, uh, the parents. Parents decide what is good for them. Like, because, I mean, they are in, in charge of their kids in any case. So, so global policies should be set to a minimum level. I mean, that should be with the consultation of all stakeholders. So I agree with you how it should be a tiered approach in regards to that. So in Australia, very similar, in 1996, they tried to impose mandatory content filtering. It's been tried multiple times through the Australian politics. The government there is separated into a nation government and then you have different states and then you also have local states. The problem with that, though, is that they all needed to agree on that. In 2008, they were able to push something through called this clean feed. That clean feed meant that there was actually two lists. There was a mandatory list and an optional list, where, as an end user, you could then opt out of that. The problem was that there was no transparency in that. This mandatory list was made up and is monitored by an organisation called ACMA, and I don't remember the, what that stands for, but they basically create this list of blocked websites, and they said there was about 1,067 sites on there, and that there was this strict guidance on how you get a site put onto that. Child <laughs> pornography, abhorrent content, or something like that. The problem was, in 2009, a journalist said, OK, let's test this. And so he sent his own website saying, this is terrible stuff, it needs to be removed. And it wasn't, it was just an article about this content filtering. Guess what? It was put on the blacklist. And then there's a well-known forum called Whirlpool in Australia. They posted his story about that, which had a link to his website that was put on the blacklist. So they then got a cease and desist order which meant that would get fined $11,000 for having this article on their website if they didn't remove it. $11,000 per day, sorry. And that caused a lot of issues. And then WikiLeaks got hold of a list called this blacklist from the same um, provider of ACMA. But they added more content to it. And so ACMA argued you were breaking the law and you needed to remove it. We're going to add you to the WikiLeaks to the book blacklisted site, and they said, hold on, it's not the same. Your list, you said there's only got 1,000 sites on it. I've got 2,500 sites, so it doesn't match, and that caused issues there. So if you are going to do content filtering, you need to have a process in place where it's transparent. But then if you make it transparent, what happens with the internet? If you find a malicious site, you just mark it for takedown, it gets taken down. What happens in less than an hour? it comes up under a different name. So that then you can't have transparency. In 2006, one of the politicians that were arguing against this content filtering said, all you're doing is slowing down the internet. Because all this filtering is going to cause slowing of that process. And if you have a look at uh, a large example, well-known example is China. They do content filtering at a national level on a massive scale but they have millions of people and manpower and hours that go into doing that, okay? That is a, a problem in regards to it slowed down the internet so bad. All the schools go through Beijing and they have multiple filtering at different stages through that process. With that filtering, though, they were able to bypass that quite easy. There's an example if you have a look on YouTube about the Great Firewall of China and the, lamb, the Lama. So you do a search for Lama 
through the Chinese characters and that bypass or caused the firewall to block that because of the way that the characters were. So there are issues with using technology to filter. Think about society though. When you're looking at content filtering, what do you do with your children in society? If you were going to do content filtering of your children, not on the internet, but and real world activities. So what's dangerous to your children? Crossing the road. So does that mean you're not going to let your children out of the house anymore? But you're not going to allow them to cross the road? That's what content filtering is going to do. From my point of view, I've got two children. What I do is I teach them what is right and wrong. I show them how to cross the road. If they can't do it safely, I take them to somewhere that makes it safe. In Australia, we have traffic lights. You've got traffic lights here. So cross at a traffic light when the light is right, rather than just jump across the road. As adults, as you said, we are adults, we know how to do things. But again, there are some adults that can't cross the road properly. They get hit all the time. So content filtering is going to do things like that. There will be adults who need content filtering because they are susceptible <coughs> to online scams. But then that's where the education comes in rather than the technolog technological way of fixing it. That's not the way to do it. And in Australia, we can still bypass a lot of this because all they're doing is that if you use a particular internet service provider and you stick with their default settings and their devices, you will be stuck to their content filtering. All you do is you use your own device or you change your own DNS. How many open DNS servers are available to you at the moment? So you can bypass it. In regards to how you said you've got to protect children, yes, you've got to do that. And that at schools, they do have a duty of care to do that. And yes, we do that sort of filtering. I used to deploy into schools, Apple computers and networks and things back in 96, and we had to do content filtering of some sort there. At the start of the World Wide Web, as most people know it, there was multiple instances of that. Did you know that? So there was not only the World Wide Web, but there was America Online. That was its own safe version, sanitised version of internet. There was CompuServe, another sanitised version, but again, Yes, it was sanitised, but there was people that could put other content on there and change things. And nowadays, recently as last year, Russia is looking at creating their own Wikipedia, so that way they can control the information that goes there. Scotland has put in a proposal to be able to create their own <coughs> version of the internet to make it safer for people. So the unwanted material, and they're going to make all ISPs connect to that government internet. But whether that's going to be the best thing or not, it's up to the people to decide. And if it doesn't work in regards to what someone wants, you think about, I did a talk before about security. The more secure a system is, the less usability you're going to have content filtering be like that. In regards to protecting children, I've known people in Australia where they basically won't let their children use a TV set, won't use any electric, electronic device at all for religious reasons or for personal beliefs. However, they get exposed to it every day through their friends. So a lot of the children that are basically content filtered from that point of view they just go play at their friend's place and they get exposed to it that way. So you mentioned about having that tiered approach, you still will get that. The other problem though is advertisements. The advertisements, I've seen children surfing YouTube, yet the advertisement comes up is to do with different objects that are adult orientated, not very good content to be seen there. So there should be something done about that in regards to advertisement. But again, you think about real society in Australia, we can't do, there's certain products like cigarettes and alcohol 
can't be advertised on TV during certain hours that children would be watching the television. <coughs> in Australia, we actually have no constitutional rights to free speech. It's just assumed. It's not actually written in any legislation. And that's what a lot of people argue when they talk about the clean feed, is that that's impeding our free speech. But that's just some of the views there. It's, from my point of view, I believe that as an adult or as a citizen of the community, I try to share knowledge with people on how to act safely online, how to make decisions. Some examples of that is that younger children, should they be having a mobile phone in their bedroom where they're all alone by themselves without adult supervising? My daughters were not allowed to have electronic or screens in their rooms. They're all in the public area where the screens could be seen at all times until they earn that trust and they understand what's good or bad. That way there is no content filtering. I think I've, I have done content filtering once and that was a punishment because of the fact that she didn't do the, what she was supposed to and I blocked access to Minecraft. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> ဘာလိုပဲပြောမလားရာရာပြောမလားအပိုင်းတုံးမိုင်းရှိရင်အချိန်အချိန်လေးကျွန်တော်မကျော်ချင်ပေါ့တုံးမိုင်းမယ်တ
General Biao Biao, in essence, General Ray, spiritually, General in spirit, General Yong Ji, they have a lot. So, when Chao Ray gave us this, it was now investigate Lopua police at Biao Biao. The website they do not change now. So, so they will yam about the algorithm they do here. You have a CDR sheet. Ah, internet ISP is losing logs is here, right? Pedure Biao Biao is a customer information related to GBT. They are not doing it. So, come to learn. ก็เราไว้จะเอาไอ้เจ้ามาพูดพูดนี่เลยบ้างเนี่ยเนี่ยเฮ้ยเนาะทำไมทำไมลงตะเกียบลงเยอะเลยล่ะครับเนี่ย
အခုတကယ်ရမဖြစ်နေတာကျွန်တော်တို့ကကုန်တန့်ဖြစ်တာတွေကိုကျွန်တော်တို့လဲပဲတွေကျွန်တော်တို့အသက်ရွယ်တွ
some content filtering to parents so, and children, so that way they had this cyber safety concept. And so they basically, that was an opt-in content filtering. So for those parents that were concerned, they could go to the ISP and say, do you have content filtering? So Net Nanny became a very popular product. Yeah, Cyber Nanny. We knew it as Net Nanny, and then I think it went to Cyber Nanny. But that soon meant that every child in Australia knew how to bypass it. It didn't take long. <laughs> yeah. In uh, 2017, the government has now spent $82 million on an educational campaign for cyber safety. Can I, can I add one thing? Uh, like, I mean, definitely the education should be the key, like making the students aware. Uh, this implementation of whatever the policies that we are talking about has a major challenge in this part of the world. I mean, I'll, tell, I'll share basically my experience in Sri Lanka. Like, uh, it's not that, uh, that we are implementing content filtering there as such. But in our generation, like the kids are much more smarter than uh, parents. So you cannot actually, so even go for a two-tier system. So you cannot actually let the parents actually block because students actually will be smarter. They will actually get somehow uh, like uh, the found uh, different ways of actually bypassing the system. So it is not, uh, not possible to do that. Uh, I mean, even though conceptually it is possible, practically it will actually run into, uh, run into difficulties. At the same time, I would like to actually highlight uh, the, 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 the issue is basically, unlike many parts, many developed countries, I mean, we population in our, our parts of the world, this South Asia, Southeast Asia, this part of the world, the, there are many hierarchies, hierarchies in the sense like many segments whose actually knowledge about the external world actually is very limited. And, and as a result, actually students are there. Children actually learn much more about the, uh, the outside than their parents. And, and what happened actually is if they do not actually get properly educated on what to access or what, I mean, proper education about uh, the, the safety, cyber safety and all that, they will learn from their kids, their, from their peers. And it all depends on their peer network and how good their peer network or how bad the peer network is. So it's like uh, a content filtering will not actually block any of those things as such. So whatever the, whatever the policies that we are trying to implement, I think, uh, the, if at all, like if a government decides, okay, this is the set of policies that we want to implement, it has to be very minimal, as I said at the beginning. I mean, it should be very minimal type of blocking that, that wider stakeholder forum actually decides, not the other way around. So oh, we, are, we don't like to go back to the old age. Oh, oh. <laughs> so... <laughs> so I have experienced that uh, after government decided to not filter anymore, uh, I bypass, I remove every route. After that, internet is apparently very fast. Uh, so I, I also do not like to go back that age. So thank you so much for your discussion. So Sherry. So our our suggestion should be the parental control. It, it will be education and parent parental control is the best instead of filtering for the all people. So thank you so much. Shall we also discuss about the solution? <laughs> solution? No, no, no. Amma, how about you know, even though we do not encourage filtering, we still should have a logging policy. That means all the traffic should be fully logged for, uh, log retention should be as far back as, I don't know, three years, so that there should be investigation. If there is anything, we should be able to uh, mobile number and KYC. And one, one other problem that we have is mobile phones, right? You can, any, anywhere you can go in Myanmar, you can buy a, a SIM card for free. Uh, or you, you can get a SIM card for like 500 juts or whatever, which is like 50 cents. And there is no registration process, and you can do whatever harmful thing, and you can throw it away. And that creates a, another problem, right? Because I think in India, if you go there, you need to register your NRC and your passport. And without it, confirmation that your identity, you are not allowed to access. Maybe that's another way of... Uh, ensuring that whatever you do, uh, hey, you know what, we're not going to block you, but we know what you're doing. So it may stop people from committing crimes.
Yeah, the mobile phone concept that is getting locked down in a lot of countries. I travel a little bit. So different locations, you don't need to show any ID and you just get a mobile phone number. In Australia, it's getting to the point where you need to provide a credit card as well. So you would have to have 100 points of ID to get a SIM card and then you've got to have um, a credit history check as well on top of that so you just can't keep buying a new SIM from that point of view. In regards to data retention, that caused a lot of problems in Australia for the fact that ISPs have, there's a new legislation that came in in 2013, 2014, mandatory data retention of the metadata around the session. So basically who you're emailing, but not the content or which websites you're going to. The problem with that from an ISP point of view, you have to make money, yes? Now that you're storing all this extra content and you're having to implement a lot of other services to store this content, who's going to pay for that? The customer. Are they? Are you going to then charge a the customer extra for a service they're already receiving at a certain price? No. So that caused a lot of issues, a lot of discussions and a lot of um, feedback from ISPs. In the end, the government gave in and offered a assistance program to pay for some hardware. But then the mandatory data retention, they have to keep the data for two years. But the, there's a list of 12, I think 12 or 13 agencies that can access it. And there's some agencies on there that shouldn't be on there at all. And then you can go to the court system and ask for a warrant to get access to it. So a journalist, again, got to love the journalists in this regards, did an application, was able to access a politician's metadata and then figure out that he was doing all this stuff that he shouldn't have been doing. Uh, yeah. uh, can, can they access individual data by just right, right to information? It's like Right to Information Act? Yeah, it's, so but but that is... <laughs> that is actually like I'm just uh, regarding. I want to t touch on two points regarding the mobile free SIM. I think it's a bad idea. Like I think Sri Lanka is also you need the national identity card uh, to uh, to register SIM. You will not get a free SIM as such. So the data retention might be good for post analysis, uh, but but I think uh, the access to that should be limited to whoever the agencies, not to individuals who can use the Right to Information Act to to basically like uh, peep into any <laughs> individuals. In, in regards to the, f f the person, no, they weren't actually arguing for this particular politician. They just knew that based on his phone number, he was with this provider. So they then did a Freedom of Information Act. Oh, actually, no, they didn't do that. They went to the court systems and said that we think that he's doing corrupt and they asked for a warrant. They got a warrant to the ISP to get access to a particular set of metadata for this period of time and then you think about when you surf the internet, your system is telling different details about your surfing habits. It's saying what operating system, what patch level you are and you can fingerprint someone based on that. And so they were able to then fingerprint the activity and then assume or made it a knowledgeable guess that it was this person doing this at this time. Actually, I think Google knows everything about us more than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. So, uh, but uh, from the from the government perspective, because we we keep discussing more about the, from the user perspective or individual perspective, but uh, if we talk about let's say rules and regulations, really of the country. We, we know that content filtering and basically um, these issues needs to be, to be discussed and needs to be solved in a multiverse approach. So basically, policy needs to be in there. That's the purpose of having a government, right? So, but let's say if we put these policies in place, enforce it, who do you think should have access in terms of enforcement to make sure also that the experience is... is um, <coughs> It's common. Basically, if the users move from ISP 1 to 2 to 3 and to 4, it will be the same kind of user experience. So, 
do you think it's, it makes sense for the ISP to have a solutions in place on a per ISP level just for enforcement, but rather the policy is controlled by the government? Is it something that you had seen in, in, in the country that you're in? So in Australia, when they've been asked to do something based on legislation, they do it per ISP. It's not a government policy as such. Policing this is going to be difficult. If you think about in Australia, the law enforcement is still catching up. They're always catching up when it comes to technology because they don't get the funding. Their main business is law enforcement, not technology. So are we going to get the law enforcement agencies to go and enforce these? And therefore, they're going to have the skills and understanding on what a network is, what the different protocols are, what databasing is, are they storing the right material? And then they need to know that it's not fake because I can always create my own data. That's another issue you're saying about government regulation. We, the government has offered funding in Australia, but it didn't, it's a, tip of the iceberg. It's not enough money. You think about back in 2013 how much it was to buy a large storage array network to store this data that you have to retain for two years. You're storing this in a data centre somewhere because you've got to have to make sure that you've got redundancies and you're going to have to do backups and there's all these other things as well. And then in some cases the warrant allows for it to go back further. And then you've also got security on top of that being able to lock it down to make sure no one gets access to it. It doesn't get infected by ransomware or something like that. Because yeah. um, the government, it just, I think there would be nobody out there that could be, as in a corporation or government body, would be able to police it or monitor that it's been implemented correctly. Because there's, how many ISPs were here? 140? Is it? Licensed? At if maybe round about 30. Right. I mean, in, in, uh, all the licenses. All the licenses are more than 100. Yeah. At if, at if ISP maybe just 30. Yeah, 30. but then sending someone in and auditing their system, making sure they're compliant, but then doing it on a regular <laughs> basis because if you do it once, I don't know about you, a lot of organisations when they know they're having their order of some sort, they get ready three weeks beforehand, make sure everything's perfect, they pass the audit and then they no longer do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so the ISO 27001, ISO 9001 and things like that, the organisation madly runs around to comply when the auditors are there and then they no longer do it. Yeah. Exactly, it's expensive and as if we're going to put this onus on ISPs, then you're going to have um, the business model. How are they going to make money with that? If you do it on the government, where's the transparency? So there's the issue there. And then if you do it on the end user, it's not going to be consistent. So. Okay, thank you for discussion. So I'd like to conclude that uh, we are not recommending content filtering for the uh, global level, so, but uh, individual ISP or parental control. And uh, we are also recommending for the login and monitoring system. Also, education is the most important for any other comment. Do you have uh, like uh, connectivity given to the schools? Because actually my primary experience has been with the providing uh, the internet facility to schools long time back in 2007. Uh, so there the requirement actually was critically there. Like uh, even now, if you look at it uh, in US, I'm not exactly sure the current status as such, uh, US has the CEPA Act. They call the Child Internet Protection uh, Act. And uh, where they are, they are, the government, there's a mandate uh, to block image-based uh, blocking. Uh, so so how they implement that is not exactly sure. I think it's still they do uh, 
uh, offline classification. It's not real time because if you do real time image based classification, it will be very slow, uh, very slow, uh, like everything will slow down. Uh, but the, the CPAC clearly says it is like blocking image based uh, 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 like sites. So I do not know the exact statistics or how actually they do that as such. But for schools, I think if you are providing school to internet, uh, the internet actually provided to schools during their, uh, the school time, there has to be some kind of a measure because education loan actually will not uh, like help. Thank you. So any question about our uh, discussion? I just want to put, there, there, when you're talking about schools, I worked for uh, Queensland, Education Queensland and their content filtering was a whitelist. So everything was blacklisted, as in 100% blacklisted. And if you needed to have a resource that was on the internet as a teacher, you needed to prepare that and send it to get approved two weeks before you needed it. So it was a straight out block everything. And, and yeah, we have, we, well, when, when we are, because about the, there is a package, everything block and selectively allow. We have something called port request. All the ports are blocked, except for port 80 and 443. That's how the proxy bypass happened, because, uh, you know, 443 is allowed. Uh, and in Singapore, I think they are blocking all the educational networks because they get, they're very vulnerable to phishing. Uh, they are blocking to teachers and lecturers and polytechnic and professors. All the edu internet is blocked. So what happened is if you go to office, you need to use the internet. You have to take out your phone and do a tethering. And uh, even then, your uh, restrictions will not allow you to go to certain sites. So that's how uh, Singapore is doing the filtering. How many of you use a web browser? Yeah? Did you know that there was a proposal for HTML version 1.0 of rating classification for websites? So just in Australia, we have a classification of movies being G, PG, and so on like that. That proposal came out in 1992, uh, 93. And the idea was that when you wrote a web page, you actually put what classification it was. And every browser that was created, and it's still in Internet Explorer today, where it will check for rating. And you can set that as a basic content filtering today to say that any websites that meet this do not allow that to display. And that's available in your browsers now. It's very hard to find. A lot of the browsers rely on Internet Explorer, so if you're running Microsoft, you go in there and you set it up and then that will affect your other browsers. But yeah. And the idea is that the onus was on the developer of the content to give it a rating. And then if you disagreed with that, you could then submit and that would then get reviewed and then they would change the rating on that site. So yeah, that could be an option. Because as a global event, it's easier for someone to say that this website isn't there. And as long as the board that is reviewing had the uh, strict guideline and they could follow that, that would be good. Just a cl clarification, this is, you are referring to something like a movie classification, right? Movie? Very much like it. So, if it's bloody so story, it's like a voluntary uh, thing. Uh, But the problem is, Facebook we don't we don't use web browser, bro. We just use Facebook. Facebook. Facebook <laughs> is the internet. Where is Matt? And Viber is SMS. We don't use SMS. We just use Viber. So it's a responsible for even the Myanmar police force is using Viber to submit, you know, traffic police. You know, you can take video and send it to them. Yeah. Because who use browser, man? Yeah. The browser is so, I don't know, it's not for millennials. <laughs> it's that designed for baby boomers. But I'm just pointing out that there has been, there a, has been a potential filtering solution. So I'm just in Internet Explorer. 
Oh, when was the last time you see this? Yeah. I haven't been using browser for a long time. I'm even gonna find it myself now. Uh, it's hitting away somewhere. Advanced, probably. Oh, maybe they don't have it. I haven't looked for decades. Advanced, probably. No, because it's usually under the content here. Oh, content, right. Settings? No. Yeah. No, that's, it's not there. I'll have to find it. Once I find it, I'll put it up on a slide somewhere. Maybe install it. No, no, it was in here. Maria Bros, I'm on the phone. Oh, but Pomi and Gondello, Facebook are shallow. Phone is shallow. Facebook are near the messenger. Facebook messenger. They've gotten rid of it, so there you go. No one used it. This is one more comment, I think. Um, I mean, we, we might be talking about content filtering today, but in uh, five to ten years' time, the world will be a different place. Yes. So the, the digital natives will be the parents, right? And, and I think so most of the things that we are talking about will not, no longer be applicable as such, because there is, a, at the moment, there is a gen, the, the generation gap between parents and the kids and, and all those information. The awareness to our expo the, like to, to the extent to which uh, that you are exposed to internet is different from uh, from generation to generation, and that creates a lot of issues. But in ten years from now on, I think the, most of the adults and most of the kids actually will be on the same level as far as the exposure is concerned. So we won't be actually. It is more like self-control from that point onwards, I guess. Oh, oh, general, the good thing is that you know, content filtering, low man solution, eh? Content filtering, low people are being used. That's how much. Who in the crowd would like to have content filtering? Just raise your hands. Anybody? Content filtering. Whatever the purpose. Content filtering, DNA, terror, and solution. How can I do it? อ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่า
their members that voted them in, they vote on all their processes and whatever the vote ends up being in the app is what the person in parliament will do. <laughs> so that's live action. So as a community, if you vote more of these sort of politicians in, you get instant capability to vote on issues that are being presented in government. That's how the, pol the politics are going to change. You mentioned about five years' time, the technology is going, we're talking about content filtering today, it may not even be necessary. And if you think about traditional politicians, in Australia, the youngest person to get elected as a politician had just turned 18. He's still, he's been voted out now, but it was, it was all over the news. And it was amazing that he got in, but he was able to then relate to the younger generation. Whereas if you ask me, I've been around for a while, I still use a browser. I don't use apps to go to, to Facebook. And that's what you're saying. Come on, we use Facebook in an app. So, yes, that's right. There's different people use the technology different ways. Okay, any question from the audience? So, uh, Mira, I mean. What is content? Uh, maybe uh, according to this conversation, uh, according to this discussion, uh, is content is a website or is content is an IP address or is uh, content is content is a uh, uh, information uh, that contained in that website or that post or something like that. So uh, I think it must be clear. Uh, should we call uh, filtering uh, information on that content or the whole website like that? Uh, we should be clear. Or uh, in our uh, theoretical point of view, or uh, we can uh, filter the content uh, according to the, the semantic learning like this. Uh, so I, I want to know a little more about content. Uh, how do you define the content to filter? Okay. Um, for me, content is anything that is visible to the user. So that's in general, anything about it, text, pictures, uh, it's part of the content. But now the challenge is like, I understand what you were saying about uh, filtering the contents or blocking the whole site itself. Um, there is pros and cons. Of course, if you do the, the filtering of very specific content within a website, for example, it consumes a lot of resources just to achieve the goal. So it means that there's a huge investment that needs to be done on the back end just to support that requirement. While if you block just the full website, it's maybe a typical solutions out there, readily available, DNS-based, uh, DPI-based, firewall-based, and so on, can, can do the job. So. Um, for, for me, the content itself is something, yeah, it's always in questions because they also mentioned that who decide whether this content is basically allowed or not. Who has that power? Because people, the politicians may, may play the role of being God to say that this one is illegal, maybe because it's against their policies and so on. But, but that content, that you mentioned uh, about uh, whatever is the content visible to the to the user is is something that um, uh, it's it's actually anything anything that we produce anything that we show to the end users visible to the users whether it's using their uh, mobile devices or internet browsers or computers. I just um, from a purely from a technology point of view, I think the the content actually is, as he rightly said uh, it will not be like for example a sentence based or like a paragraph based filtering is impossible to do in real time so what uh, what the, uh, the what the technology actually has allowed is classification of the websites 
based on certain standards. There are some international standards. I forgot the exact name, exact number. There's are international standards which classify the websites into so many categories and subcategories. And, uh, and whether, whether people actually would agree on these categories is a different issue, but there's a standard uh, that basically uh, categorizes the web into so many, so many uh, different uh, uh, like categories. And under each category, there are a lot of subcategories as well. And based on these subcategories, I mean, you would actually filter. Like they will, they will study that particular, so it's offline, completely offline uh, uh, a process where uh, somebody actually will sit down and maybe with experts or maybe with the, with the whoever who is actually uh, like has some expertise on that area and will classify their website. And I think this, this classification is not permanent. I mean, they, they, this classification will change. Like if somebody objects, they will again review and actually do that. So the, all I can say actually, there's not arbitrary as such, but uh, there is a standard saying, okay, these, these, these contents should go into these categories. But whether to block these categories or not is, is someone else's uh, like job. But classification is done according to a standard. Content, content is very common. Our general digital news and content provided is our tone, Google bar, one of text bar, image bar, video bar, one of our content. Time a con content or pay honey application, a good visible piano to live a load as or to live a load a browser and election. I know Facebook and election. I know Uma Tower, which are not Majalo content, general Majalo content here, Tower, oh, how Majalo. I hate you know cockroach, but a cockroach going. Website go to a lucian, a pong web, pepo, plural, po, low pencil in technology, a jan, lure. And a website did who long, a ma, poha, poli, pa, damoe, poha, cockroach, a colomba, and a website to cool on, block, low lime as a polo, a loop drop your. And at the coupon, no? Now that go app tema solution, post the coupon, go thing in the go, a ma, poha, do it, so double yavy tenite. And I'll go la rob, ma piavo, high low poa, go your preference. No future giant general hyper personalization, so I pull out a Big data, like pure like how. Or popular so. Dilu dia go piar content, dilu piar go piar content macam tu lor. Entah nak aku lawas apa, jenar homogeneous lor korang. Lu dah tua je, ek website kat tu tu. Dah macam hyper personalised pure like app dia. Facebook lor, hamil Twitter lor, ah, now YouTube tu. Paling so, ko preference ni, ko ye behaviour, ko ye history, ko je biro tu apa piar ek content macam tu lor. Jom bawa bawa lah. Or ek content tu apa blog lor lu jah. Eh, so preference ko jenar apa blog lor lu jah. Or content tu dia je jah classify macam lu dah, blog lor lu macam ni. The content classification is called G, P, G, R, M, and ratings. If you look at text, you can see the content creator, the content creator, but the classification is not the same. You can see the content creator, and you can see billions of contents, right? How are you going to classify into buckets? The buckets are in the table. You can see the library, the government job, the ISB job, the user job, and the content creator. As on content, content is out there. Content classification is a challenge, and content filtering, and how to not to show. But also, website them hold on. Kuna jono bolu browser them dumam tono. Ero Twitter ema, Instagram ema, chilo jen. Okay, browser don't mind. Thay me browser don't ne. Thay me browser ko don't ne luga. Aku lolo jen me maling ema toto ne doa bi luju no solu jena. Okay, yeah. Oh, that oh you you have a right to differentiate. Yes. Tu ada tu, pada tu orang. Tapi Facebook tu tahun ni aja mah. Kau kau yang kelir ya, tapi kau yang dia orang ni orang pada tu orang Facebook tu orang scroll tu ni lah. Kau blog tu cina content tu ni. Facebook kau blog tu ni tu. Ada teknologi ni yang wap cipta. Eh, ait ya ubi milo, buat apa? Pelu outdoor buat so lalu ya. Di luna solusi ni, oh daro ubah bono di buat jono beberapa ni mah. Oh app ID sih, user ID sih. Eh, ada ciri biro. Eri mah, per content tu blog tu cina sah. Conversation level di tu aku blog lalu ya. Facebook ada lalu lalu tayar nama, ikan, tayar ni dia, jono ni mati mungkin ni dia, tu apa? Sekarang mah biasa ni urutin, tu apa? Kau bro blog lalu lagi, di di dua, tu jono phishing scam lalu ni esok. Ela awal lalu, biro ikan tayar tu jono apa? Kau biro tu filtering lalu dia, tapi macam dah jono apa? Permission beri tahu, nama tu ikan lalu automatically filtering lalu ni, jono mah minta ni ya, minta ni kau macam ni, mah kaya jono hari hari lalu dia, tapi tengah jam hampir lalu, tapi mahu buat di luar tu sejuk ni esok, tu kau blog lalu lagi jono tu mami aro. เอออะไรอย่างเงี้ยเราไม่เข้าใจเลยทีนี้เออคอนเทนต์อ่ะมาเนี่ยมาพี่เรอมีเรื่องไหมก็มีพี่โอ้เจนามุชิเอล่ะ
কন্টেন্ট উত্তম আছে না বলো ডাইরেক্ট আর কন্টেন্ট নাই মাঝে মাঝে আর প্যাকেজ হয় মা অ্যাপ্লিকেশন কা ভা ভাড়া তো দৌনি ধীরে রা বুধু বুধু সি তো আমি আর কম ব্লু কন্টেন্ট মিউলে বলো ব্লু ব্লু সিগনেচার অ্যাপ মিউলে আসবো কো যে আই হি রেটিয়া গোড়ি আলু লোক উতি লো যাবো আর এই আই সিগনেচার টেকনোলজি রে ওয়ারে সি রে ওটা মানে কো ভাই ও কাস্টমাইজ লো বিরো ডি ডি কন্টেন্ট রো গা মি জি উ ডি ও ডি ও সাইড হে আমি ডি পোম পো জিং সুরা মিউ বলো เอ่อโอ้เนเนอร์ว่าเนเนอร์ก็เลิกเสียบิ๊กแล้วกูอะเฉยเนี่ยเนเนอร์เปิ้ลลงมาไปจ้ะเมย์วางวางอยู่ช